hope you're doing well and of course Arnie does too. Now some of you out there seem to like my last two videos on hybrid animals, so today I will be continuing the series. Hybrid animals captivate the minds of many people, whether they're in the wild or in captivity. As there's so many animals that are closely related, there's an endless amount of possible hybrid animals. In today's video I'll be once again scratching the surface, as I'll be going through five hybrid animals from around the world. And for our first parent species we'll be heading to the cold arctic waters, as we have the narwhal. The narwhal is a medium sized tooth whale that possesses a very large tusk. This tusk is actually an enlarged tooth with some impressive sensory capability. It can be up to 10 feet long and contains up to 10 million nerve endings. These tusks are thought to be used to detect temperature, water pressure and particle gradients in the water. In their cold icy homes they feed on halibut, cod, shrimp and squid. On this diet they can reach a maximum size of around 5.5 meters not including their tusks. The males are slightly larger than the females but they reach an average weight of around 1,600 kilograms. And to put that into perspective that's around the same weight as an Indian rhinoceros or two false killer whales. This size means they're protected against some predators, but a narwhal's life can still be quite dangerous. Some individuals are often killed by suffocation after being trapped under sea ice. They are also preyed upon by orcas and they've been harvested for hundreds of years by the Inuit people. The narwhal is only one of two living species in its family and unsurprisingly our second parent species is in this family and it is the beluga whale. The beluga whale shares its arctic waters with the narwhal and they share many similarities. The beluga whale is also known as the white whale as it's the only cetacean to have this white colour. This white colour helps it blend in with its icy environment and is just one adaptation that helps it survive in these waters. Its absence of a dorsal fin allows it to swim under sea ice with ease and its protuberance on the front of its head houses an echolocation organ called the melon. This melon helps it navigate its environment and makes it easier to find breathing holes under sheet ice. Beluga whales are the most abundant toothed whales in the Arctic Ocean and tend to be very opportunistic feeders. They have a wide range of prey items but tend to prefer fish such as cod, salmon, halibut and flounder. On this diet they can reach an almost identical size to the narwhal, although the belugas do not grow those large tusks. Just like the narwhals they are also preyed upon by orcas and sometimes even ambitious polar bears. Although it's thought to be very rare, these two species are thought to be able to interbreed and create the narluga whale. There had been reported sightings of this hybrid for years, but no physical evidence. In 1990 a scientist named Mads Peter Heide Jorgensen happened across a weird looking whale skull in an Inuit hunter's tool shed. The hunter had killed the animal a few years before and the skull looked neither like a narwhal or a beluga. 30 years after this discovery, the DNA from the tooth in the skull was analysed and it was confirmed that it was a hybrid of the beluga whale and the narwhal. But as this is such a recent discovery, unfortunately there are no pictures of this hybrid as of yet. But for our next parent species we'll be heading to the Atlantic coast of North America as we have the striped bass. The striped bass is a predatory species that tends to spawn in freshwater and they naturally spend most of their adult lives in saltwater. Although they naturally move out to the ocean, they can actually spend their whole life in freshwater and as they're such a popular sport fish, they have now been stocked in many fishing lakes. In both their freshwater and saltwater environments, they most often feed on other fish, including gizzard shad, white perch and herring. The average length of an adult is around 90 centimetres, but the largest specimen ever recorded weighed around 56 kilograms. Unsurprisingly, the striped bass is closely related to other bass species, and in this bass family is where we find our other parent species, the white bass. The white bass is a smaller freshwater species of bass, which is widely distributed across the US, particularly in the Midwest. They are more disc shaped than the striped bass and tend to be a lot smaller, reaching an average size of around 40 centimeters long. Although these two species are quite different in shape and size, they are able to interbreed to create wiper bass. These hybrid bass share characteristics from both parents and have proven to be very popular with anglers. These hybrid bass are considered to be better suited for culture and ponds, as they've proven to be more resilient to extremes of temperature and to low dissolved oxygen content. They became part of aquaculture in the United States in the late 1980s and currently around 10 million pounds are produced every single year. Although this hybrid can occur in the wild, they are most commonly created in hatcheries as they've proven to be a very profitable fish. So I'm sure many fishermen out there will be very happy that this hybrid exists. But for our next parent species we'll be heading over to the Galapagos Islands as we have the marine iguana. This reptile is unique among modern lizards and spends a large portion of its day foraging for algae in the ocean. This algae makes up almost all of its diet and although it may not look like a very good swimmer, large males are able to dive to find this food source. The smaller males and females tend to feed in the low tide. They are a relatively large lizard reaching an average size of around 1.5 meters long. After using up all of their energy foraging in the ocean, they can often be seen on beaches and in rocky areas where they sneeze out all the salt that they've taken in. Before humans inhabited the Galapagos Islands, life was a lot easier for the marine iguanas. Humans brought with them feral cats and dogs which are known to predate on these iguanas. But these 
These lizards also have some natural predators, such as the tiger shark and the Galapagos hawk. Surprisingly, the marine iguana isn't the only iguana that can be found on the Galapagos Islands, as it shares these islands with the Galapagos land iguana. This species is again endemic to the Galapagos Islands, and they tend to inhabit the dry lowlands. In these areas, they are primarily herbivorous, and they get the majority of their water from prickly pear cactuses. But these iguanas are also known to be opportunistic carnivores, and will supplement their diet with insect centipedes and carrion. They are a little bit smaller than the marine iguanas, reaching an average size of around 1.2 meters. Unfortunately, these iguanas are listed as vulnerable to extinction, with they're thought to be only around 5,000 to 10,000 left in the wild. Although the land iguanas and the marine iguanas diverged around 8 to 10 million years ago, they are still able to interbreed to create a hybrid iguana. These hybrids are thought to be created by a male marine iguana and a female land iguana. The first hybrid iguana was discovered in 1981, but since then there have been many more sightings. In 1997, high ocean temperatures caused the failure of seaweed beds, resulting in many marine iguanas travelling inland to find a new source of food. Many of these iguanas mated with the land iguanas, producing an unusual amount of hybrid iguanas. As these hybrids can't breed, they can have a negative effect on both populations. So although they're very interesting, they can have a negative effect on the population of both species. But for our next parent species, we'll be heading over to Africa, as we have the serval. This predatory cat is widespread in sub-Saharan countries, and in these areas it is a solitary carnivore, and is active both by day and by night. It primarily feeds on rodents, as well as birds, frogs, insects, and reptiles. This species is a medium sized cat and stands at around 62 centimeters at the shoulder. These cats are known for their impressive jumping ability, as this species is able to jump 3 meters into the air. In the wild, some predators are known to feed on these servals, such as leopards, wild dogs and hyenas. Although the serval is a wild animal, some people choose to keep them as pets. This is a very bad decision in most cases, as these cats are wild and have specific needs and inherent instincts, which means that they are not suited to most homes. But our second parent species is very well suited to a home, as it is the domesticated cat. Cats are some of the most popular pets in the world, and it's thought that the oldest known pet cat existed 9,500 years ago. Although these cats are domesticated, they can still be quite wild. They share around 95% of their genetic makeup with tigers, and often exhibit wild behaviours such as scent marking, stalking, and pouncing. Although there are many different types of domesticated cats, some cat owners want something a little wilder. That's where our next hybrid comes in, as the serval and the domesticated cat can interbreed to create the savannah. Cats. These strange hybrids became popular at the end of the 1990s, and in 2001, the International Cat Association accepted it as a new registered breed. Although these hybrids are very popular with some cat owners, they do come with some complications. There are incompatibilities between the two species, which often result in pregnancies being absorbed or aborted. This has caused many people to question the breeding of savannah cats, so although they may look very interesting, many people see the breeding as a cruel practice. But for our next species, we'll be heading to North America as we have the coyote. The coyote is a close relative of the wolf, but tends to be a lot smaller. As coyotes are smaller than wolves, they tend to feed on smaller prey. In some areas, they are welcome pest controllers, as they feed on a large number of rodents and rabbits. But in some more urban areas, they're seen as a negative species, as they often scavenge for food, and even feed on people's pets and livestock. The coyote was once only found in the southwestern and plains areas of North America, but us humans helped them spread. As the Europeans moved west, it pushed out most large predators such as wolves, cougars, and bears. These predators kept the coyotes in check, and as they fell in number, the coyotes were able to spread. They can now be found in almost every corner of North America, and even adapt to urban areas very well. The story of coyotes and hybridization is quite a complex one, as our next parents are both the eastern wolves and the grey wolves. These wolves are a lot larger than the coyotes, and although they're closely related, they genetically diverged around 55,000 to 117,000 years ago. And when it comes to evolution, this is a relatively short amount of time. As they are closely related, it is possible for the coyote to interbreed with both the eastern wolf and the grey wolves. When these two species do interbreed, they create the koi wolf. Although these hybrids are possible, they are quite rare, but there is another hybrid that can be found over large areas of North America, and these hybrids are the eastern coyotes. These coyotes are often hybrids of three animals, the coyote, the western wolf, the eastern wolf, and the domesticated dog. This hybridization likely first occurred in the Great Lakes region, as western coyotes moved east. It was first noticed in the 1930s, and most likely
likely occurred after the grey wolves had been forced out of the area. This meant that the coyotes could colonise the former wolf ranges and mix with the remnant wolf populations. This new hybrid can now be found throughout most of the eastern United States, but in most expert opinions they shouldn't be called coy wolves. This is because they contain DNA of different animals, and in most cases they are majority coyote, with some wolf and dog DNA mixed in. So even though eastern coyotes aren't exactly what you'd call a coy wolf, they are one of the most interesting hybrids that can be found in the wild. But that's about it for this video. If you want me to make a part 3 then let me know down in the comments below. But thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these. But until next time, goodbye.